My name is Ryan Shattuck. I'm a fourth year uh, resident here, and I'm going to be giving my last grand rounds today. Um, oh. yeah. <laughs> so sad. Um, but I'm going to be talking about anterior knee pain and the patellofemoral pain syndrome, um, which is a very uh, confusing um, topic for a lot of clinicians. So why is this important? Um, one of the most common complaints that athletes come into sports medicine clinics for is anterior knee pain. Um, and there's been some epidemiologic studies that have been done that have looked at this. Um, in a 10-year study of over 19,000 athletic injuries, 40% of injuries were to the knee. Um, and in an Australian sports medicine clinic, over a 12-month period, uh, they found that anterior knee pain was the most common presenting symptom. <clears throat> so recently, there's been a big increase in the amount of people that are doing running events. Um, and as you can see, like in 1990, there was about 5 million people. And in 2013, there was almost 20 million people um, doing these events. Um, and as the growth of events have increased, um, you can expect that there would be more pain, um, more knee pain. Um, in a poll of 4,500 people on runnersworld.com, they found that 13% of runners suffered knee pain in the past year. So in this presentation, we'll talk about um, some terminology and some confusion over the terminology. Um, patellofemoral pain syndrome, including um, the anatomy and biomechanics at the patellofemoral joint, um, what is causing the pain, and factors that contribute to the development of this pain. Then we'll go into a classification system um, that you can use for anterior knee pain along with other diagnoses. diagnoses. Um, we'll review the anterior knee pain pathologies, including general treatments for anterior knee pain and specific treatments based on these diagnoses. So a lot of the confusion um, comes from the terminology that's used, um, which a lot of it is very vague and people use these, a lot of these terms interchangeably. So anterior knee pain is a nonspecific term and should never be used as a diagnosis. Uh, this includes many diagnoses. <clears throat> Sometimes people include patellofemoral pain syndrome as one of the diagnoses. Um, so we'll talk about patellofemoral pain syndrome as uh, peripatellar retropatellar pain, which is coming from the patellofemoral articulation. And um, the, this is different than chondromalacia patella, um, which sometimes people use interchangeably with patellofemoral pain syndrome. So chondromalacia patella is damaged to the cartilage under the patella, and it may be present with, uh, with anterior knee pain, but usually this is a surgical finding. So some basic anatomy of the knee, it's a hinge joint, um, flexes to about 140 degrees, and this, var this can vary depending on muscle mass too. Um, extension, be to about zero degrees and there's some internal and external rotation which can vary with the flexion and extension. So there's three functional compartments in the knee. Um, the, medial, uh, the medial and lateral uh, tibiofemoral uh, articulations and the patellofemoral um, which is what we'll be talking about today. Um, and the patella moves relative to the femur from full flexion to the to full extension and you'll also see some tilting and rotation of the patella as well so on this x-ray this is a normal x-ray um, uh, of the patella in the trochlear trochlear groove um, and you can see the joint space is preserved and the patella is sitting in the appropriate position so the patella is the largest sesamoid bone in the body and it contains the thickest articular cartilage in the body. It's measured to be about four to six millimeters or um, 0.25 inches. And it's necessary to have um, this thick articular cartilage because of the large amounts of force that are needed to be transmitted through the patella. Um, we'll go over um, some of those forces. So if you look at um, the back part of the patella, it's, it has a lateral facet, a medial facet, and the medial and lateral facets are divided into uh, superior, middle, and inferior um, articulations. Um, and 75% of people will also have this uh, medial to the medial facet called the odd facet. Um, 
And a lot of times this is the first part of the patella um, with osteoarthritis that gets worn down is the odd facet. Um, the odd facet doesn't come into contact with the trochlea until about um, until over 90 degrees of knee flexion. So the stabilizers of the patella include the, medi uh, the medial patellofemoral ligament, um, which is the primary stabilizer to lateral displacement. And you can see that over here. Um, the, uh, the patella ligament, medial and lateral retinaculum. So medial retinaculum is, is over here, lateral retinaculum is over here. Um, these provide passive stabilization. The dynamic stabilizers are the muscles. So the four quadriceps muscles um, provide dynamic stabilization to help uh, keep the patella in the trochlear groove. Um, the distal parts of the vastus lateralis and vastus medialis have an oblique orientation and are referred to as uh, the, the VMO um, uh, and the VLO. So the VMO, um, the orientation of the fibers are different in everybody. Um, but on average, it's about a 55 degree angle. So they provide medial and lateral um, medial stabilization to the patella. And it's a very important muscle, but we'll talk about it um, later. So some patellar uh, etymology. Um, in the Western world, the term patella originated from the Latin term patina, which means shallow dish in the 17th century. Um, Separate from this, in India, it was referred to as patella hadi, or farmer's knee in the 13th century. So when uh, Western medicine was introduced, um, the two terms combined to form the modern use of patella. Now we'll go into some evolution of the human knee. Um, so the, the human knee dates back to 320 million years ago to this creature called Ariops. And it's a common ancestor to rep Tiles, birds, and mammals. Um, this is actually the first creature to have a bicondylar knee with asymmetric cruciate ligaments, menisci, and collateral ligaments. However, the patella was not present yet. Um, as evolution continued, the fibula moved distally, the femur rotated internally, and everything progressed closer to midline. And about 70 million years ago, the patella developed separately in mammals, birds, and reptiles. So because all these, uh, all these uh, types of animals developed it separately, um, you'd think it probably has some importance for uh, terrestrial existence. Um, but what's the purpose of the patella? The major function is to improve the quadriceps efficiency, and it does this by increasing the extensor moment arm. And it can increase the extensor mechanism by up to 50%. Uh, other important things about the patella is that it centralizes divergent forces of the quadriceps muscle and it transmits these forces through the patellar tendon. Um, and there's large amounts of forces and we'll go over in the next few slides, but the hyaline cartilage, like we we're saying, is thick and it can bear these high compressive loads. And finally, it provides a bony shield for the distal femoral condyles. So this slide kind of shows when when the patella engages with the trochlea. Um, in full extension, the patella is not sitting on the trochlea. It's superior to the trochlear cartilage. And it, at about 10 to 20 degrees is when it begins to engage in the trochlea. Uh, at about 30 to 90 degrees, it's fully engaged. And after 90 degrees, um, contact is reduced and the odd facet comes into contact. So on this side shows uh, about 135 degrees. This is where the contact is. Um, and at these at uh, 20 degrees, the inferior pole of the patella begins to come into contact. And it just increases and moves superiorly as the knee flexes. So superiorly in relation to the patella. It's also important to look at the, the area of contact or the amount of contact on the patella as the knee flexes. So at 30 degrees, there's a, a small, only a small amount of patella of the patella that's in contact with the trochlea. It's about two centimeters squared. Um, but at 90 degrees, um, there's maximum contact area, so it triples. Um, so this is important because with the with the high amount of contact area, it decreases the total amount of force because there's uh, the force is dissipated over a larger area. 
So when you look at patellofemoral forces, it's pretty complicated because you have to look at a combination between multiple different factors. Um, so you have to look at the articulation and contact area because the forces are reduced with a larger contact area. Um, you have to look at the force vector between the quad and the patella tendon. So as you see on this diagram, as the knee flexes, there's going to be a larger force vector um, pulling the patella posteriorly. So this increases with knee, knee flexion. And then muscle contraction is greatest at terminal knee extension. So with the higher muscle contractions, you're going to have more force pulling on the patella, pulling the patella backwards as well from the quadriceps. So forces differ with activity, um, walking about half the body weight, um, ascending stairs about three times, descending stairs about five times, jogging seven times, and deep squatting can be uh, up to 20 times the body weight um, in terms of forces that go through the patella. So is the compressive force always highest with increased flexion, which it looks like it is according to this last slide. Um, so, and is it always best to perform terminal extension exercises? And the answer to both of those is no. Um, you have to remember that the quadriceps force is greatest at terminal extension, and you're putting a large amount of force on a smaller area. Um, so this can, can, can create considerable uh, joint reaction forces. So uh, what, are, what causes the anterior knee pain? Um, what are the structures that are involved with... Uh, the pain. Um, so disorders of this joint are, are probably one of the most complex or perplexing conditions in sports medicine. And Dr. Scott Dye, who's an orthopedist, um, has devoted a lot of his career to studying this condition. He's referred to patellofemoral pain as the black hole of orthopedics. Uh, many people use anterior knee pain and patellofemoral pain as a diagnosis. Um, this is this is pretty vague though because you're not really saying what the source of the pain is uh, and we'll go over um, what's our what some better diagnoses are a little later um, but what it what actually is the source of the pain in these conditions so dr. dr. Dai um, in a study in 1998 um, <clears throat> did this pretty crazy study where only using local anesthesia his partner um, scoped his knees and what they did was they palpate, palpated different structures in the knee with only local anesthesia. So he was able to rate the pain when they palpated the different structures. Um, so he rated, he rated the pain on a scale of zero to four, and he also rated the localization of the pain um, to see like, if he was able to determine where they were uh, touching um, with the instruments. Um, so what he found was that the anterior synovial structures retinaculum, fat pad, and anterior joint capsule caused the most pain, moderate to severe pain, and he was able to accurately localize those. At the insertion of the cruciate ligaments, there's also <coughs> moderate to severe, severe pain, but with poor localization. And the interesting thing was that there was no sensation on the patellar articular cartilage, even though they found asymptomatic, even though they found grade two to three chondromalacia. Um, so what are the implications of this? Uh, this means that degenerative changes to the patellofemoral joint, um, which is chondromalacia, or wearing down of the cartilage on the back of the joint does not directly produce patellofemoral pain. Um, the thought is that it may lead to chemical or mechanical synovial irritation, um, edema or erosion, and that can cause some of the pain. Um, but the anterior, the anterior structures, like the retinaculum and fat pad, anterior capsule, are likely the origin of pain in a lot of these conditions. Um, so it's important to be able to classify anterior knee pain. And in 1998, uh, four of the leaders in sports medicine at that time developed uh, a classification system. And the goal was to create, create categories of diagnoses that share uh, similar treatment guidelines. Um, one of the problems with patellofemoral pain is that there are such inconsistent results um, with people in the rehab of this of this condition, and not every patient should be um, treated with the same type of rehabilitation. So they classified anterior knee pain into the following categories: uh, the patellar compression syndromes, patellar instability, biomechanical dysfunction, direct patellar trauma, soft tissue lesions, overuse syndromes, and neurologic and other disorders. 
so we'll go through all of these except for the neurologic and other disorders. Um, so the first one is part of the patella compression syndromes, and it's uh, called excessive lateral pressure syndrome. So as you can see on this, this picture right here, um, it's caused by excessively tight lateral retinaculum and loose medial retinaculum, which will pull the patella laterally and also um, tilt it laterally. Um, they usually have uh, lateral retinacular pain, um, pain climbing stairs, pain squatting down. Um, frequently, there will also be medial pain due to stretching of the retinaculum. Um, this can result from uh, mild congenital tilting of the patella, uh, which shortens the lateral retinaculum and loosens the medial retinaculum. And it may be asymptomatic for a long time, and then at some point um, over the years, it can develop, it, be, it can become painful. So on exam, patients will have loss of patella mobility. Normally, the patella should be able to be displaced about 25% of its width um, in either direction while, while the knee is in full extension. Um, so in this condition, with the tight lateral, uh, lateral pressure syndrome, displacing it medially will be difficult. Um, you also frequently see atrophy of the VMO. Um, which is related to uh, patellar position um, and pain inhibition causing re reflexive inhibition, pain and inflammation causing reflexive inhibition. So you can see uh, this, this patient is, this uh, doctor is doing a patellar glide test. Um, it's a medial patellar glide test. Um, and so there'll be decreased mobility with that. Um, palpating the lateral border will be difficult, and there will usually be a high medial border of the patella. Radiology can be helpful sometimes with this. Um, and you can see in this, the patella is obviously lateral. It's not in the trochlear groove, and it's kind of bone on bone on both sides. The other type of uh, compression syndrome is the global patellar pressure syndrome. And this is... Uh, tightness on both sides, both lateral and medial retinaculum are tight and it leads to excessive compression in the trochlea. Um, a lot of times this is secondary to trauma uh, leading to fibrosis and it can also be due to immobilization. So the loss of patella motion, if you can, um, you can imagine that it would lead to decreased motion at the tibiofemoral joint just because the patella is unable to move <coughs> superior and inferiorly um, in relation to the femur. So this is frequently associated with development of flexion contractures, and this is especially true when people are mobilized in flexion. Um, you'll, you'll see disuse atrophy of the quads frequently and loss of flexibility of quads, hamstrings, and the IT band. So like we're saying, patella glide is restricted in all directions. Um, X-rays can be helpful in the diagnosis and a lot of times to the extent of the condition. Uh, the next group, the next uh, category in the classification system is patella instability. And this will range from acute dislocation to recurrent instability. Um, the amount of lateral tracking varies, uh, but normally the patella will track laterally at the extremes of range of motion. So in full extension and full flexion, the patella kind of moves laterally. Um, the first, uh, the first part, the first um, type of patella instability is chronic subluxation, and frequently these are this is associated with um, anatomical things like a shallow trochlear groove. Uh, so, chronic sub patient patient with chronic subluxation will have excessive lateral mobility. Uh, usually, they don't have much medial sensitivity, um, like they do in the excessive lateral <coughs> pressure syndrome, um, and it's thought that this is because tissues adapt to the stretch chronically. Um, they'll complain of giving way, catching, locking, or the knee feeling unstable. So a test you can use for this is called the patella apprehension test, and it's frequently positive in this condition. So you'll have the patient um, flex their knee to about 20 to 30 degrees, and this causes uh, the patella to engage at the trochlear groove. So if you remember, the patella is not engaged at uh, full extension. So at 20, degree, 20 to 30 degrees, it should be in the trochlear groove. Um, then you, you apply a lateral force to the patella, and the patient will guard um, against this by contracting the quadriceps. So you should be suspicious of this condition if there's subluxation 
uh, greater suspicion of subluxation if there's greater than 50% uh, of the patella that can just be displaced over the lateral edge of the femoral condyle during patella gliding. And that's done with the, with the knee in full extension. You also want to observe the tracking from full extension to full flexion um, without a force applied. And frequently you'll see an abrupt lateral movement of the patella at terminal knee extension. So we'll, we'll talk about uh, dislocations, which is also, which can be considered instability or trauma. We'll talk about that in a later section. But now we'll go into biomechanical dysfunction, which is, uh, which is the next classification system or the next classification category. Um, so a subtle alteration in normal biomechanics can have a large effect um, if this is applied over a long period of time. Uh, so it's important for the clinician to evaluate the kinetic chain uh, both proximally and distally. And we'll refer to those as remote factors. And then they also have to look at biomechanics at the patellofemoral joint itself, um, which are local factors. So the first uh, remote intrinsic factor is increased femoral internal rotation. Um, this can be seen as squinting patella, where the patella uh, kind of facing medially during st uh, st uh, static standing. <clears throat> During walking and running, you can see increased internal rotation. That can be seen as an apparent valgus. Um, also, this can become more apparent during single leg squatting. The second type of biomechanical factor that's associated um, with this pain is um, increased apparent knee valgus. So male, the male Q angle is about 12 degrees, and the female Q angle is about 15 degrees in normal people. Um, so the Q angle is measured uh, um, from, as the angle from the anterior superior iliac spine to the center of the patella, and then the patella through the tibial tubercle. So it's this angle right here, um, and it's wider in females than males. Um, this can be the apparent at this angle, and this can be more apparent during gait. Um, or single leg squatting, running. And it's caused by increased hip adduction and internal rotation, uh, as well as lateral pelvic drop. And frequently it can be due to weakness of the gluteus medius. The third, uh, the third biomechanical factor is increased tibial rotation. <coughs> and this can cause increased patellofemoral joint loads uh, through transferred rotations to the femur. So, as the, as the tibia rotates, the femur will also rotate many times, and strongly coupled with motion at the subtalar joint as well, which brings us to the next intrinsic factor is the pronated foot type. So this, this foot is uh, in pronation. This is the medial part of the foot. This is the lateral part of the foot. So this is pronation that we're talking about, and this is supination. Um, so pronation is also associated with tibial internal rotation and this type of pain. And finally, inadequate flexibility can be observed in all the muscles that affect knee movement, um, including the TFL, IT band, rectus femoris, hamstring, quadriceps, and gastrocnemius. So one term that, that you may hear is pronation distortion syndrome. And this is kind of a combination of all these biomechanical dysfunctions in the kinetic chain. Um, it's caused by excessive foot pronation, femoral internal rotation, and hip adduction. Um, associated with tight perineals, gastroc, soleus, IT band, adductors and hamstrings, as well as weakness in the posterior tibialis, anterior tibialis, glute medius, and maximus. Um, and this altered alignment leads to increased strain on soft tissues and compressive forces on the joints, and it's associated with uh, numerous different types of injuries. So this is what we're talking about um, with, with this. Uh, the knees coming in, femoral femur is internally rotated, the foot's pronated, so the foot's not directly under the knee, and that can lead to, so as you can see, like the patella tendons in this angle, leading to increased forces at the joint um, where you don't want them. And if, if you look at this guy doing a single leg squat, you can see that the hip is dropping, and he's leaning his body over this side, and that's frequently caused by weakness in the glute medius. Um, you can also see it on this picture when somebody's running too, and so like single leg squatting, and running can bring out these things, even if you don't notice them when somebody's just standing still. Um, 
So the local in intrinsic factors are factors at the patellofemoral joint, um, which are uh, abnorm biomechanical abnormalities include the patella position. So lateral displacement of the patella or lateral tilt of the patella and tilt means the medial border, border will be high and the lateral border will be low and be difficult to palpate um, the lateral border. Um, posterior tilting in which the inferior of the pole uh, inferior pole of the patella is tilted later, uh, posteriorly. Rotation of the patella, um, so the patella is not in parallel with the axis of the femur, and also a high riding patella or patella alta have all been um, biomechanical factors associated with anterior knee pain. So it's important to assess passive and active movement in all directions. And the last uh, biomechanical factor is neuromuscular control of the vasti. Um, so you can see this as reduced quadriceps activity in general, um, reduced or delayed onset of the VMO relative to the vastus lat lateralis, um, reduced magnitude of the VMO related to vastus lateralis, and altered reflex response. Um, so there may be muscle wasting, but as you can see, normal bulk doesn't always equal normal function, and sometimes it's the onset of these muscles, and when they contract that can be related to this pain. So we'll go into the, uh, the next category, patella dislocations. And this refers to complete displacement of the patella out of the trochlea. Um, so in the, in the acute situation, when somebody comes in with this, they'll have significant swelling, pain, limited range of motion, um, pain at the adductor tubercle, because frequently the medial patellar ligament is torn. Um, and that's, the, that's uh, one of the major stabilizers of the patella. Um, and then there'll be significant apprehension on exam. So these are kind of like pretty obvious that the patella is not in where it's supposed to be. Um, you can see that there. <laughs> um, but recurrent patella dislocation rates are high. Um, it's about 15 to 44%. And that's with conservative treatment, so non-surgical treatment. The, the rates of recurrence are usually about 15 to 44 percent. They usually affect females more than males and adolescents more than adults. Uh, the next category is direct patella trauma. So this, so you could include um, dislocations and patella trauma, uh, dislocations in this category, or you could include it in instability. Um, but this is a patella fracture. Um, it's clearly fractured there. And it's going to be caused by falls, bumping into objects, sports, um, it be patella fractures, dislocations, cartilage injuries. Um, and usually they'll complain of diffuse anterior knee pain or retropatellar pain. Um, on exam, there'll be crepitation and exacerbation of the pain with quadriceps contractions. The next category are the soft tissue lesions, um, including plica syndrome, fat pad syndrome, medial patellofemoral ligament injury, bursitis, um, and IT band friction syndrome. So we'll go over a few of these. Um, so for plica syndrome, um, when the body is in the embryo embryologic stage of development, um, there's multiple cavities that combine to form uh, the knee capsule. Um, and as these, ca as these uh, cavities fuse together, they can sometimes <coughs> form folds. Um, so these are usually, these are synovial folds found along the edges of the patella, and you can have suprapatella, infrapatella, medial or lateral plica, and they're not always symptomatic. Um, usually it's the, the medial patella plica that will become inflamed if this situation is present. Um, and it can be caused by direct trauma or excessive squatting and kneeling. And chronic inflammation can lead to fibrosis and impingement on the medial femoral condyle. So these patients may complain of aching in the knee while in the flex posture, clicking, popping, giving way. And a lot of times extending the knee can be associated with a snap or a pop and then relief of the symptoms. So the area that's most usually affected is the inframedial quadrant of the knee. So this area below the uh, medial to the kneecap. And a useful mnemonic to remember for this situation is the TARP sign. So taut articular bands that can be palpated. 
um, in the medial prepatellar region, which reproduce the pain. In fat pad syndrome, there's irritation of the infrapatellar fat pad. Um, this is also known as Hoffa's syndrome and Hoffa's fat pad. So this fat pad um, directly behind the patellar tendon. Um, a direct blow to the knee can cause impingement between the patella and the femoral condyle, so the fat pad can be impinged in here. Um, and it's irritated with repeated or uncontrolled knee hyperextension. Um, in the chronic stages, can lead to scar tissue formation and contractures, which can lead to more pain. Um, pain is often exacerbated by extension maneuvers or prolonged standing. Um, there's usually tender, or almost there's almost always tenderness at the inferior pole of the patella, uh, deep to the tendon, and contracting the quads with knee and knee extended may exacerbate the pain. Um, and if you remember from the study that Dai did, uh, this fat pad syndrome and tear knee joint are some of the most uh, were some of the most painful structures that were palpated um, when his knee was examined. There's numerous bursa in the knee. Um, one of the most common ones that you'll see is pre patella bursitis or housemaid's knee. And that's right in there. And it can be caused by a direct blow, uh, fall, or kneeling for long periods of time. And it'll look, it'll look something like that. Um, in the acute phase, it'll be very swollen and tender. Um, and it should be differentiated from an effusion of the knee joint, as this is, this is an inflammation and swelling of the bursa, not coming from. Um, the joint capsule. So the next group, the, ne or the next category in anterior knee pain are the overuse syndromes. This includes patellar tendinopathy, um, quadriceps tendinopathy, and the ap apophysitis, um, which are Osgood Slaughter's lesion and Sidney Larson Johansson lesions. So patellar tendinopathy, this is referred to as jumper's knee. Um, it's frequently seen in um, jumping athletes like basketball, volleyball, high, long, or triple jumps. And the pain is at the inferior pole of the patella, right below the kneecap. Um, it's caused by repetitive overload of the extensor mechanism of the knee. So jumping will cause that. Um, however, the term patella tendinitis is really a misnomer in a lot of these patients is the pathology they'll present to you with is not usually an inflammatory tendinitis. If you, we go over the tendon healing cycle, there's an initial inflammatory phase which lasts for 24 to 48 hours, um, in which there's erythrocytes, platelets, and inflammatory cells cleaning dead materials. Fibroblasts are recruited and begin collagen synthesis. So this phase only lasts about 24 to 48 hours. And a lot of times when patients come in, it's during the repairing phase, during the next six to 12 weeks, at which time there's no more inflammation. So type 3 collagen scar patch will form. Um, the normal collagen is type 1 collagen. So this is abnormal collagen. It's healing collagen. There will be neovessel and uh, new nerve ending formations, which also come into the area. And then after this phase, you have the remodeling phase, which um, is just the phase at which the tendon is becoming more normal and healing. So the type 3 collagen is replaced with type 1 collagen. Um, there's new blood vessels and uh, the new blood vessels and nerves are removed and at this time the tendon can be considered healed. But disruption in this cycle can lead to painful thickened um, tendons uh, that are also weak. So if you look at these tendons under microscopic evaluation, there's disorganized collagen, um, necrotic, necrotic collagen fibers, small vessel ingrowth, and the histopathologic picture um, is referred to as tendinosis. So most people that come in with this type of pain really have tendinosis and not tendinitis. And tendinopathy refers to, is kind of like a term that covers both of those. So this can be aggravated by jumping, changing direction, accelerating. Um, there's tenderness on the inferior pole of the patella. Distal lesions are less common and mid-substance lesions are pretty rare. On exam, you should reproduce the pain using functional activities. Uh, such as squatting or hopping. Um, and these are, it's important to do it like this because you can use these functional activities to monitor their recovery. Um, and it's, a, it's easier to do that than just asking about pain. Ultrasound can be used to assess this as the Doppler is good for assessing neovascularization. And it's actually more sensitive than MRI. 
So another uh, way to monitor progress in people with this condition is through the Visa P questionnaire. So it's a Victorian Institute of Sport Assessment Scale. And it's a series of eight questions. Um, the patient can rate uh, the questions on a scale of zero to 10. Um, it includes uh, sitting pain-free, walking uh, downstairs, um, non-weight-bearing stenches, lunging, squatting, single leg hops. So they rate all of this and it can be used to monitor um, the progress. So the best way to palpate the inferior pole of the patella um, is by applying a um, distal and downward pressure to patella and that tilts, tilts the inferior uh, pole of the patella up so it's easily palpated. And that's the best way to do it instead of just palpating it with the knee in full extension. Um, it's a lot harder to get to the inferior pole of the patella like that. So next is the apophysitis. Um, so Osgood slaughter lesion is a traction apophysitis of the tibial tuberosity. Um, this occurs during uh, high ac activity levels during periods of rapid growth. So like during puberty in boys and girls, this can be seen. And it's more common in boys than girls. And the lesions right here at the tibial tuberosity uh, where the patella tendon inserts. It can be exacerbated by activity um, or palpation. And you can, see, you can see a bump there a lot of times on exam. Um, it's also been associated with subtalar pronation, patella alta, and hamstring tightness. So traction apophysitis are self-limiting um, <clears throat> developmental derangement of normal bone growth, and they involve centers of ossification in the epiphyses. Um, Sindig larsen johansson lesion is similar to osgood slaughter lesion. Um, that it, it's also a traction apophysitis, but it develops on the inferior pole of the patella. So right here, and you can see these on x-ray sometimes. Um, you can see the chronic changes in this x-ray. So when people talk about patellofemoral pain syndrome, they're probably talking about, usually they're talking about these three categories, which you can divide them into. It's not usually direct patella trauma or the soft tissue lesions that they always use, but um, those three categories. and. Patellofemoral pain syndrome has been also called runner's knee, and it's a very broad term which describes pain in the front of the knee or around the patella. Um, so it can be classified into compression, instability, biomechanical dysfunction, which lead to abnormal tracking, alignment, and forces at the patellofemoral joint. Next, we'll go into some general anterior knee pain treatment and rehabilitation. Um, and a lot of these things can be used with any type of anterior knee pain. So we'll go over these and then go into some specific treatments based on an accurate diagnosis. Um, so for a lot of patients, you can use these things and then tweak it based on the diagnosis. So the first thing that you should always do, try to do is to reduce the pain and swelling. Um, frequently patients have joint effusion, edema, and pain, which can be after surgery, trauma, repetitive use, and it's important to get rid of the effusion. Um, there's been studies, and one study in 1984, um, in which uh, they looked at knee joint effusions, which led to quadriceps reflex inhibition. Um, so they injected saline into the joint, into the knee joint, and at about 20 to 30 milliliters of fluid injected, uh, the vastus medialis was inhibited. Um, at 50 to 60, the vastus lateralis and rectus femoris were inhibited. And this has been shown in numerous studies as well. Um, the pain also, as we know, pain can cause reflex inhibition as well. Um, and it's, it's important to get rid of the pain and the swelling. So it's different treatments you can use would be cryotherapy or ice, um, high voltage stimulation, passive range of motion, analgesic medication, and knee sleeves or compression wraps can sometimes be helpful. The next step is to restore muscle function. So you want to restore uh, volitional control of the quadriceps mus musculature. Um, so a study in 1991 showed that incorporating electrical <coughs> stimulation along with exercise uh, was beneficial. Um, so they found that following ACL surgery, the patients that received electrical muscle stimulation plus exercise had stronger quadriceps and more normal gait than exercise alone 
after four weeks. So in this stage, you want to start isometric and isotonic exercises, um, including quadriceps or quad sets, straight leg raises, hip abduction and adduction exercises, as well as knee extensions. So if you don't know what uh, quad sets are, this is, this is what a quad set is. Um, you have the patient sit down with a towel underneath their knee and have them just try to push the knee down into the towel, and this will activate the quadriceps muscles. Um, next step is to strengthen the quadriceps. So the quads are the most important shock absorber during weight bearing and joint compression. Um, and weakness in these can lead to increased forces at the knee. So on this diagram, you can see the pole of the different muscles in the quadriceps. This is the VMO. It's probably hard to read, but this is the VMO, and you can see it's um, pulling at about a 50 to 55 degree angle. Um, this varies depending on the patient and the orientation of their muscle fibers. Um, but in many patients, it has a greater influence on medial stabilization of the patella than on extension, actually, and the other muscles provide more extension. Um, there was a recent study in 2015 in which they looked at sling-based exercises, um, and the closed kinetic chain knee extension stimulated the VMO to VL at a better ratio than open kinetic chain extensions. Um, so the optimal ratio from what I found was about one-to-one -one, um, from VMO to fastus lateralis. So this is a sling-based exercise, and it's becoming more common to see these done now. So you have the, this is the closed kinetic chain knee extensions with the sling. So the patient's knees are uh, flexed at about uh, 60 degrees, um, and they'll bridge up and push their knees down. Um, so this, this will contract the quadriceps. If you wanted to do this open extension, the sling would be moved up to the knee, and, the, and then the knee would be extended like that. So the reports on selectively strengthening the VMO are <clears throat> conflicting, and some say that you can, and some say that you can't. Um, but many of the exercises that they suggest to isolate the VMO in the past have been found to be detrimental to the joint and the biomechanics uh, of, at the patellofemoral joint. So it's one of the things that's been suggested um, to, to stimulate the VMO more than the other quadriceps musculature is to squeeze an exercise ball between the knees during squats or leg press, um, but this can be detrimental in the long term because it creates an internal rotation of the femur and lateral tracking of the patella in relation to the femur. So instead of doing this, it's probably better to squat or leg press uh, with an exercise band around the knee, um, which creates uh, more abduction that you need to do at the hip. So like this with a TheraBand or an exercise band around the knees squatting down, um, We'll, de we'll put the, the femur in more external rotation and activate the hip abductors more, which is a lot of times what patients need um, who have the patellofemoral pain. The next step in general rehab for these for anterior knee pain patients is to address the kinetic chain. And it's important to treat the cause and not the symptoms. Um, many times pain comes from the biomechanical deficits at the hip um, or the ankle and foot, and not just from the knee joint. So you have to look, um, you have to look proximally and distally for uh, any abnormalities. Um, most exercise and everyday movement takes place in the sagittal plane, um, and people um, have coronal and transverse plane weakness. Um, so you have to strengthen the hip abductors and external rotators for many of these patients um, to control the motion in the sagittal plane. Um, and control valgus movement, or the apparent valgus uh, at the knee. Um, it's important to correct overpronation, and many times these patients need to use orthotics. Um, along with orthotics, you should use foot posture exercises, such as towel grabs or short foot exercises, in which you're kind of contracting the muscles in the arch of the foot, um, as well as pool running. That can also be helpful. So improving flexibility, including the quadriceps, hamstrings, IT band, hip adductors, and gastrocnemius is important in a lot of patients, as well as improving soft tissue mobility. So this includes flexibility of the medial and lateral retinaculum. This can be done by manual patella mobilization, 
um, or by patellar taping. So you, it, with patella taping, uh, tape can be used to hold the patella in the proper position. And the studies aren't clear whether it actually affects patellar tracking, but it's thought to probably work by providing prolonged stretch to the retinaculum. And patella stabilizing braces can be used um, to maintain medial glide in patients with patellar instability. So this is an example of a patellar stabilizing brace, and this is stabilizing the patella in all directions. Um, this is patella taping, so she's so they're pulling the patella over um, medially to prevent any type of lateral tracking, and also more so to stretch the tissues. Um, then you want to improve proprioception and balance. Start with weight shifting side to side and diagonally. Um, progress to mini squats, and then mini squats on a tilt board or foam pad. Uh, and ball tosses while squatting, and some people jump or landing training if that's necessary <coughs> for their sport. Progress back to activities should be uh, gradual. Um, you don't want to overstress the healing tissues. So now we'll go into some specific treatments based on accurate diagnoses of what's causing this pain. Um, general principles can be tweaked based on the diagnoses. So for excessive lateral pressure syndrome, heat therapy is usually beneficial along with ultrasound, soft tissue massage, um, mobilization of the patella, including taping if it's excessive lateral pressure syndrome. Um, you, don't, you don't really want to use tape in global uh, patella pressure syndromes. There's uh, tightness in all directions of the retinaculum, and you don't want to tighten any part of it. Um, generalized lower extremity stretching, improving quadriceps strength. And in a 1986 study, it's reported that 31 out of 33 patients um, with ELPS returned to full function after non-operative treatment. So surgery shouldn't be done um, in most of these patients. For chronic instability, um, you want to enhance the static stability. Mm -hmm. Bracing can be used for this. Uh, you want to enhance dynamic stability as well, so improve strength and progress to or muscular control exercises along with endurance exercises. Uh, if there's recurrent dislocations, you may need to limit participation in specific sports or activities. For biomechanical dysfunctions, again, it's important to address the whole kinetic chain. Uh, 1993 study showed that soft foot orthotics plus exercise improved the telephemoral pain more than exercise alone um, in patients with excessive foot pronation. So you want to work on hip strength, for patients with leg length discrepancies, they often have compensations, including pronation, towing out, and a flex knee posture, which also can contribute to some of the pain. Um, and flexibility is important. Um, for direct patella trauma, uh, trauma can lead to cartilage damage. Um, this is considered non-operative. Uh, there's no fracture or malalignment. Uh, these, you should, these patients should be instructed to frequently do range of motion exercises throughout the day. This may enhance cartilage healing. You want to do quad strengthening, but avoid any painful exercises. For the soft tissue lesions in general, you want to stop the activity that's causing the lesion. Avoid direct pressure on the lesion. Um, Anti-inflammatory treatment can be used in the acute phase, but a lot of times these patients, especially the ones with the patella uh, tendinopathy, aren't in the acute phase. Uh, for plica syndrome, you want to avoid repetitive flexion, such as biking and running. Uh, for fat pad syndrome, avoid excessive quadriceps activities, as the patella tendon can compress the fat pad. Um, in tendinopathy, again, you'll most frequently see tendinosis. So, but for tendinitis, you want to reduce inflammation, restore strength and flexibility, and just address any biomechanical dysfunctions. In tendinosis, anti-inflammatory treatment is not helpful. Uh, so you want to start with mechanotherapy, which consists of eccentric exercises as well as slow, heavy resistance exercises, and these should be used for six weeks. After that, there's different. There's a bunch of different treatments, um, which include extra tendinous and intratendinous. So some of the extra, extra tendinous treatments out there are glycerol trinitrate, uh, Graston, active release therapy, extracorporeal shockwave therapy, acupuncture, dry needling, sclerosing therapy high volume image guided injections and percutaneous scraping. The intra tendinous uh, treatments include platelet rich plasma, stem cells, percutaneous tenotomy, 10X, surgical debridement. So there's a lot of different treatments, treatment options out there that are being studied. For the overuse syndromes, um, include, these include Osgood-Slaughter and Syndig-Larsen-Johansson lesions. 
Um, it's important to remember that these are both self-limiting conditions and it's important to give them time. You want to avoid the activity causing the symptoms. Ice can be used for symptom relief and hamstring stretching may be helpful as these have been associated with uh, tight hamstrings. So in review, we discussed some of the uh, terminology and some of the confusion with some of the uh, frequently used terms. Um, we reviewed biomechanics at the patellofemoral joint, uh, causes of pain and potential sources of the pain. And we went over a classification system in which you can break down patellofemoral pain into different categories. Um, we discussed the general patellofemoral rehabilitation and specific treatments based on accurate diagnoses. So finally, uh, the last topic will be uh, what the future is. And I think, I think some of the future uh, things that are being studied that'll be, that'll be pretty big in the upcoming years are prevention of knee injuries in sports. Um, so in 2003, FIFA Medical Research Center um, first came out with the 11. Uh, it's an injury prevention program. And in 2006, they developed a more comprehensive program called the 11 Plus. So this consists of three parts of 15 total exercises performed in sequence. Um, the proper technique is really stressed, including body control, knee over the toe position, soft landings. Uh, and this takes about 20 minutes to perform, um, and it's performed uh, before the game. So part, run is, part one is running exercises at low speed, combined with active stretching and control partner contact. Part two is six exercises focusing on core and leg strength, balance and plyometrics and agility. Then part three is running exercises at moderate to high speed with planting and cutting movements. So the first study on the FIFA 11 plus uh, was in 2008 and it found significantly decreased risk of injury in young female Norwegian soccer players during one season. And since that time, there's been numerous additional studies um, and a meta-analysis in September 2015 found that FIFA 11 plus led to significantly decreased lower extremity injury risk. And then in overall injuries, there was, been, there was a 20 to 50 percent reduction in, in injuries. So this is a growing part of sports medicine um, injury prevention. And I think they'll continue to develop in the upcoming years. And they'll probably be um, developed for specific sports as well. And that's the end.